The laws of physics were traditionally divided into two domains. At this time, there were separate laws that explain heaven and laws that explain the human world. Newton unified these into a single framework. From then on, the world began to be understood through a unified set of principles. In the 20th century, this one law begins to break down again. It turns out that the laws of nature apply differently in the micro and macro worlds. Newton's universal gravitation, this amazing law, was still valid, but at the same time when we went to the extreme micro world, we realized that we needed to modify it. Our knowledge is determined by the language we use. The basic unit of language is also the basic unit of thought. Wittgenstein's picture theory explores the relationship between words, reality, and human thought. In any case, the laws that describe nature have changed. The way humans understand nature has changed, which in turn means the language that describes nature has changed. The meaning of particle has different meanings in the micro and macro worlds. In the macroscopic world of classical mechanics, particle and wave are completely different entities. They are contradictory words. Particles take on the properties of waves. Waves can also be seen as characteristic of particles. He famous double-slit experiment provided empirical evidence for this phenomenon. To explain these new phenomena, electromagnetism developed and quantum mechanics began. Then, Newtonian mechanics has been denied? Weren't those who believed in Newtonian mechanics wrong? You might think. But quantum mechanics and electromagnetism don't do it for Newtonian mechanics. New observations have expanded the law, not contradicted it. Newtonian mechanics of earlier eras simply cannot explain the new observations at present, and still holds, except in extreme cases. It just doesn't explain new observations, which didn't exist before, so people in the past made mistakes. Nor can electromagnetism or quantum mechanics be considered entirely new. As classical mechanics has been modified and supplemented, the scope of its explanation has been broadened. Go back. In the 19th century, many experiments with light were conducted. These experiments support the invariance of the speed of light. What we are talking about today is the answer to the question, how did mankind know that the speed of light is constant? After talking about electromagnetism for a moment, I want to talk about the michelson molly experiment and the ether. The fact that the speed of light is invariant was actually predicted to some extent before. In 1864, Maxwell published the Maxwell Equation, which consists of four equations, combining the existing theory of electromagnetic waves. This is a compilation of the previous laws of Ampere, Faraday, and Gauss, and it neatly organizes the interaction between electrons and electric fields and magnetic fields, which is a very beautiful expression. The expression is beautiful. One expression acts in conjunction with another expression, and another expression acts in conjunction with another expression. In fact, these four equations describe all the physical concepts we need to develop electronic devices. Of course, if you go to the domain of the two and the domain of general relativity, this too needs some modification, but these four equations also explain the physical concepts that are currently required for engineering. There are two things to note in the transplant. The first is the presence of waves. The second is the existence of whipping. B and E are magnetic and electric fields, respectively, and the equation tells us that they interact with each other. Also, mu and psilon denote dielectric and conductivity, which represent the properties of a medium in which magnetic and electric fields move. So what does this mean? First of all, waves and particles are not completely independent. Also, waves change their motion due to the properties of the medium. These two properties would later have a major impact on the birth of quantum mechanics and relativity. Sometimes there are people who misunderstand that the theory of relativity was born out of Einstein's head, as if something fell from the sky. But it is not. Science always has a context. Even if Einstein did not discover the theory of relativity, it is very likely that it was discovered by other scientists. There was already a lot of evidence. Let's go back. Even before Maxwell, scientists knew that light was a wave. Then Maxwell's equations explain the motion of waves. In light of the above, what determines the movement of electromagnetic waves? It's the nature of the medium. In other words, I thought that the motion of a wave would be determined by the medium, and the motion of a light would be determined by the medium. Now is the time to find the medium or substance that carries that light. 
Scientists called this unknown substance ether. Light can go everywhere in the universe, so this matter must be everywhere in the universe. Consider the movement of sound waves. Sound waves cannot be transmitted in a vacuum. You need water or air, but light travels in a vacuum. So even in a vacuum, I thought there would be some kind of whipping. It's called ether. There are many attempts to find this material. One of these efforts is the michelson molly experiment. The experiment used a device called the michelson molly interferometer. As always, the name of the person who created it. First, let's look at this interference system. On the left is the light source. And there is a semi-silvered mirror in the middle and a mirror on the top and right. And at the bottom is a device that can observe light. In conclusion, the purpose of this system is to create interference patterns because we can find the difference in speed through interference patterns. So let's look at the process. This light reaches the device in the middle. This is a silver-plated semi-transparent device that divides light into two. They're designed to split light at right angles to each other. So half of the light is in the top mirror and half is in the right mirror. The mirror is installed at the same distance from the splitter. The light is now reflected off the mirror and back to the splitter. The distance that light travels to this point is the same. The split light reaches the detector through the splitter. If the speed of light split to the right and the speed of light split to the top are different, the distance will be the same, so the arrival time will be different. So they're going to have different phases, and that's going to cause wavelength overlap. If the phase difference due to the velocity difference is exactly half the wavelength, they completely cancel each other out, and light should not be visible. There will be people here who say, Ah, I realized it. Congratulations. If there is an ether, the light going to the top mirror and the light going to the right mirror should have different speeds. This is because the medium moves in the direction in which inertia acts by the direction by the rotation of the earth. What do you mean? When the water goes down the sink, you will see the water swirling down like a whirlwind. In the northern hemisphere, it is counterclockwise, and in the southern hemisphere, it creates a vortex shape. This happens because when the earth rotates, the medium moves against the rotation as we see it by inertia. Of course, this doesn't happen in the north and south pole. You can see this in the storm. What I want to say here is that if ether exists, ether will also move vertically and horizontally differently due to inertia. Light moving through the medium also follows the direction the speed has to change. Speed. So, the appearance of light measured in the michelson molly interferometer creates an interference pattern. However, the experimental results showed no interference patterns. Reorganize. We will use the proof by contradiction. Let's assume that ether, a medium that transmits light, exists. The ether, the medium, is moved by the rotation of the Earth. Then light moving in different directions has different speeds under the influence of the ether. Therefore, interference phenomena must be created at the point of arrival. If there is no interference, the ether does not exist. As a result of the experiment, interference did not occur, so the first assumption was wrong. There is no ether. In fact, this experiment was designed to determine the existence and properties of ether, but in the end it proved that there is no ether. To further solidify the experiment, I twisted the experimental device above. If ether is present, the interference pattern should also change when you turn the experimental device. As a result of the experiment, the interference pattern did not even appear let alone change. There's something I need to go over here for a moment. Many people misunderstand the law of light. The speed of light never changes. In fact, the beam is changed by the medium. Does it contradict the theory of relativity? Not contradictory. Speed invariance is the theory that the relative velocity by the observer is unchanged, not the theory that it is unchanged by the medium. The speed of light varies depending on the medium a fact known well before the advent of relativity, and it remains true today. Light also has the properties of electromagnetic waves. What the michelson molly experiment directly showed, and was trying to show, was the existence of an ether, not the constancy of the speed of light. At the time of the experiment, there was no concept constancy of the speed of light. However, while interpreting the experimental results, I thought, ah, the speed of light doesn't change. I could think. In many of these videos, we talk about relative speed. When the observer changes, the speed changes. That's the right story. But this explanation gives the illusion that the michelson molly experiment proves the law of constant light. 
illogical leaps. The experimental system and the observer are in the same inertial system. If there is no ether, there is no interference because the observer and the experimental system are together. It's too weak. This is the correct logical structure. It turns out that there is no ether. Then light can be transmitted without a beating. This is different in nature from other waves. Other waves have been found to change speed by observers, but does light also? Isn't the light special? Can it move without a medium? Then wouldn't the speed remain the same even in a vacuum state? This is how logic should be developed. But when we actually measured it, surprisingly, light kept the same speed regardless of the observer's state. The observations were. There are many families here. In fact, the ether exists. But doesn't it move along the Earth without being affected by gravity? Isn't the measurement wrong? Light moves independently of the medium so its speed itself may be constant. After countless experiments and observations under these many assumptions and countless mathematical verifications, Einstein's theory of special relativity claims that the speed of light is constant. Again, the speed does not change. When the medium changes, the speed changes. All questions are prompted by the nature of light that moves even when there is no medium. In this regard, high school physics teachers have mistakenly explained that the michelson molly experiment directly explained constancy of the speed of light. And even some professors have blurred this and moved on to explaining relative velocity and Galilean coordinate system. Most people who call themselves science YouTubers are wrong. It's frustrating. However, the michelson molly experiment did not prove that constancy of the speed of light. This experiment gave scientists a new sense of problem, and it was through this that the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics began. From a constancy of the speed of light perspective, this experiment is simply explained, but sufficient and necessary conditions are quite different. The michelson molly experiment was not intentional, and from this point of view, it seems desirable to think of it as just one piece of evidence supporting constancy of the speed of light. From this experiment alone, we can draw several conclusions. Again, sufficient, necessary condition are completely different concept. However, since then, constancy of the speed of light has been verified through experiments, and the theory of relativity is undoubtedly the best explanation for this phenomenon. Next, we will explore the empirical knowledge is power.